treehouse water hole. They just finished drinking. There was one or two of them that kind of just gave us a little bit of a funny look, so we're going to have to tread lightly around them. Not sure why they'll be in a bad mood this morning. Not that they're in a bad mood, they're just a little bit skeptical of us, I guess. Let's try and get ahead of them. It does all. Let's see if it doesn't come trundling up to us and show us how big and strong it is. It's one of my favorite things to witness out here. See, I think Savannah's generally more open and then bushveld would be more kind of like this what we're experiencing now. We should get, oh, here it comes. <laughs> Keep coming. <laughs> that was me pretending to make a trumpet noise. I think we've got ourselves in a really good spot here. I'm hoping that if we're just a little bit patient, the rest of this herd will slowly start working their way all around the vehicle. Okay, well, I've been having trouble with my game drive radio, so Noel's been checking in for me on the Juma frequency, and there's no updates today other than elephants across here. She's operating on a different radio frequency on Chitwa. So, happy to know that we're not skipping a beach here. Hello, Beardosaurus Rex. You'd like to know if I've ever had to run from an animal. And yes, on a number of occasions I've had to scramble up trees. Uh, but as a general rule, you should not run from most of the animals that may decide to give you a hard time out here. The only exceptions are kind of black rhino to a degree. Definitely buffalo. Don't stand your ground for a buffalo. It'll just plow you over. Um, so try and get out of its way. Um, and once or twice with elephants when trying to chase them out of camps where they've broken into the elephant fencing. Um, a big reason why it's important not to run, especially when you're in groups and you're, you know, you're know being guided by a, you know, a guide on a walk, is that if everyone runs and scatters, then the guide is going to battle to take care of everyone. Oh, tiny little baby, cute, carrying a little branch along the way. Now you can hear a noise that sounds like my alarm clock going off. It's not. It's a crested barbet. I'm trying to see it for you. It's an and see who that could be. Looks like a snake eagle. I can see that there's no feathers on the legs, which would indicate a snake eagle. Wahlberg's eagles have feathers all the way down. Wahlberg's eagles are also a little bit smaller. It's looking like a brown snake eagle to me. Snake eagles are amazing, so they'll dive down and catch their prey and then start going back up into the thermals and start eating their, their snakes on the wing. Um, and the, the reason why they have scales down the legs for most of it as opposed to feathers is in case the snake bites them then the venom can't get in because the scales prevent it. If they had feathers there would be blood flow there and then the bird would have, have an issue. Now it is chilly for this bird of prey and it's also extremely windy. If it was windy and warm the, the snake eagle would probably be hunting. I think now what it's doing is it's just sort of biding its time. We're starting to feel raindrops every now and then. Oh and then off he goes as I say that. I don't think he's going to hunt though. I think he's just moving to a better perch. And now he's being mobbed by a fork-tailed drong. Is that fork-tailed drongo literally sitting on top of him, Ferg? That was hysterical. I think it grabbed onto the top of the back there. That was absolutely hysterical. Now he's trying to get a perch. He's having difficulty getting a perch there. Look, and there's the drongo. There he is, hounding him. Look at that. It's a tiny little bird hounding that huge bird. He's trying to get him to move away. I mean, obviously being a predatory bird, it's gonna possibly eat um, other bird species and, and the drongos are very good at trying to, to get them off. And now the shame, this very large uh, brown snake eagle has found an extremely precarious perch. Your other perch was much better, my friend. I don't know why you flew over there. And now he's trying to right himself and, and he can't necessarily just fly off because if he flies off and catches a wrong angle in this wind, then he could do damage to himself. So he's just trying to get his balance. Drongo definitely didn't help the scenario. And he's decided, nope, he doesn't like that one. Let's try balancing over there. Now, sometimes what you'll see with these snake eagles is um, not just with the weather conditions, but also if they're uh, a juvenile moving just into adulthood, they're still not as sure of themselves, so they can have trouble. This one's plumage looks fully grown to me, so I think he's just having difficulties with the with the gusts of wind that are coming up, and probably also just very annoyed that that drongo grabbed onto his back like that. They can rip out feathers, which can affect how they fly. And being such a large bird, they're not going to flap everywhere. They need to push themselves off and flap like that, and then glide. And he's decided that tree is not going to work for him, so he'll go find another one. That was absolutely fantastic. It's in one of the trees next to us, but I just can't see it yet, so I'll keep trying to find it. Huh. 
Where on earth is it hiding? This is a mystery to me. Obviously, it could just be behind one individual branch. It's not a very big bird. It's making a big noise, but it's not a big bird itself. Yeah, I mean, I've had to run once or twice, but generally you stand your ground. And like I was saying, as a general rule, when you are being taken by a guide on a walk, and like I said, if everyone scatters and runs for themselves, then it's going to make it very difficult for the guide to take notes of where everyone is. And also... ...position for clearly this bird calling, now that the elephants have all disappeared behind the bushes. Jeez, it's really going for it. Somewhere up in this mirror tree to our left here. Can you see it? Okay, Sensor has spotted it, so hopefully he'll be able to get you a view of it. Oh, well done, Sens. It's a little bit obstructed, but you can see it there. They are the punk rock stars of the African wilderness. Black mascara around his eyes. Or her eyes, the mouth. Thing to the side there. Oh, I was so wrong. It wasn't a little insect there on the pad. There was another insect to the side, and I think he tried, and then he missed it. Oh, fantastic. All right, I'm thinking that Scott still has his Ellie, so let's head back. I haven't seen our painted snipe, so we'll probably carry on. Uh, you must enjoy those Ellies with Scott, and hopefully by the time I see you again, we've got something else interesting to show you. Well, I'm sure Noel will have something else for you by the time you head back there. We have managed to loop ahead of this herd of elephants. I'm guessing it's possibly two separate herds that we've stumbled across. Because I can see some members of one herd heading towards the waterhole for a drink. You can just see one in the background there disappearing behind the dam wall. So we'll maybe try and loop around to see them. But there's lots of youngsters here, so I'm tempted to stay with them. They are so cute, these little Ellies, and there seems to be a little bit of a kind of playful mood this morning. Playful slash nervous. I'm not sure if it's this windy, cloudy weather that's getting them a little bit excited. Wonderful stuff. Looks like two are trying to play with one another there. Sadly, they are obscured by one of their bigger cousins. Hello, Brian. Good to have you <clears throat> on board. And you are wondering if it's more dangerous to be around a herd of elephants when there's lots of small babies like like here. Uh, you know, I think it does possibly increase the likelihood of mothers being extra protective if there are lots of newborns around. But to be honest, it's it's more about the area that you're in. I found some areas uh, in Africa, especially where elephants are persecuted by humans or possibly where they are able to attack their crops and have negative kind of interactions with humans. Their elephants can be very unpredictable and quite unwelcoming of us. Whereas here in the Sabi Sands, as a general rule, you know, most herds are quite relaxed with us. And I think even if these herds have been exposed to kind of negative behavior elsewhere, once they get into this area, there's 40 or 50 years of history here of elephants coming in and being viewed by people and not being bothered as a general rule by the people. So I think we're very fortunate here and the elephant viewing we get here is very, very good. And usually the fact that the youngsters are on doesn't really impact my assessment of the herd and the aggression of the females so I wouldn't necessarily say there's a direct correlation between danger and lots of youngsters looks like that lady's smelling something or possibly even listening to some infrasonic vibrations from other elephants in the area when elephants stop everything, you know, and, and have all their legs planted on the ground, you can almost see that they're listening. But interestingly, they're not just listening with their external outer ear like we are. They also have this incredible ability to be able to process infrasonic sounds. Don't chew on your trunk. You're too big for that now. And I think just behind him there's a hammer cop as well. There's an egret there. Yeah, so I think I'm going to sit here for a little while longer, and then as it starts cooling down, we'll we'll maybe go and look for some predators. But um, 
In the meantime, let's go over to Taylor, who I think might have found what she's been looking for. Finally, my goodness, we've been searching far and way, uh, far and way, far and wide for quite some time now. Now, we're just sitting at a distance. We're saving our repositioning moves. We're going to be strategic about them. But here's a site that I have not seen for a very long time. And that is a lion sitting with a buffalo. This is something that we uh, see quite regularly in the Sabi sand. But um, we do know how much tougher the buffalo are up here in the Mara. And they give the lions a serious run for their money. I think I've seen lions being chased around by buffalo more than I've seen lions feeding on buffalo since I've been up here in the Mara. But it looks like it's maybe a female or a youngster that of. And you can see he has started feeding upon it. So I, I don't know how old it is or when he's made this kill. But when I spoke to Jeffrey about an hour and a half, maybe two hours ago, he said that he hadn't even opened up the carcass just yet. So I assume that it's fairly fresh because not much has been eaten off of that carcass at all. Bless you. And he doesn't seem to be particularly old either. I think he's a fairly young lion. Obviously, he look at these beautiful manes just starting, starting, starting is not a word, starting to darken up. And I, hopefully he'll stand up and he'll reveal himself a little bit more before I try and guess his age. But I reckon he's probably between four and five years old, somewhere around there could also be an old lion. Maybe if he shows us his teeth, that will re reveal a little bit more. One thing I have noticed about out here is that a couple of the lions uh, seem to look all beautiful. For instance, like Notch 2. He looks lovely when he's got his mouth closed. And as soon as he snarls or, or uh, does a big yawn, he re really does reveal his age by his yellow stained teeth and they're all broken. Um, and, we, and we must remember, not all lions get big beautiful manes like Scar either. Some of them are slightly more on the tattered side. But still quite cool to come across a scene like this and it's quite funny because Manu and I passed this massive herd of buffalo and we laughed and we said, oh, the migration is back. But of course, we were just joking. Now, Brad, you're wondering if this lion is not eating because he's hungry. He's not hungry. He's probably just devoured as much as he could. So he's constantly going to keep feeding on this carcass throughout the night. But from my understanding, this is a fairly fresh kill. And he's panting quite heavily. You can see his whole body is moving quite a bit. And I don't think that's necessarily just from the heat because there's a nice cool breeze blowing about. I think that's because there's so much pressure uh, from all the food in his stomach pushing up against his diaphragm, not allowing him to take sh uh, long, deep breaths. Uh, so that's normally when you see them panting quite a bit after they've eaten. So he will eat again. And with male lions, my goodness, they can gobble up an enormous amount. And there's no rush for him either. So he'll just eat little bits, little bits. Obviously, he'll gorge himself for the first time that he feeds, getting as much in as he can. Even though he is a male lion, he's still here on his own. And there's lots of other coalitions around. There's obviously the musketeers, who don't normally roam too far away from this area. And then there's lots of young... Uh, young males starting uh, to, well, get to the point where they're going to, you know. An argy bargy going on there. It's probably two young males, or reasonably young. Um, they generally, they bulk feeders, so th there's not too much selection going on. They literally throw everything back, the juicier the better. But they do have a sweet tooth. And this I've seen in particular in the in the Sabi Sands area, in the Greater Kruger National Park, where there's the... Um, what is it that you kiss under? The mistletoe, that's it. You kiss under the mistletoe around Christmas and the elephants, they don't kiss under the mistletoe, but what they do is they push over big knobthorn trees, which is where the uh, mistletoe is normally situated, and that's because of the little uh, tinker birds who have gone and eaten the fruit and it sticks to their, the seeds stick to their bowl because it's got a very sticky mucus and uh, they then fly off to another knobthorn and they wipe their bowl uh, and the sticky seeds off on another branch and then the mistletoe grows there, but it's got lovely sweet flowers that uh, is full of nectar and the elephants know this and they push down big trees just to get to these lovely sweet tasting flowers of the mistletoe which is um, quite a shame for the big tree but uh, it's it's also great for all the little ecosystems that will then come about now i've said it before but there is a saying an african proverb that when two elephants bulls fight it's the grass that suffers the most Now, Sherry from Rhode Island, you're wondering if they're playing or if they're actually fighting. It can be a little bit of both. You know, it can, you know, like when two young boys start to f play fight, it can sometimes lead into a real fight and sometimes it can just remain a game. But it's all important for them to establish their little bit of dominance between each other and also good practice for when they are in the position that they really need to defend themselves or push for dominance. Now, the one elephant on the left there, he's, he looks like he's broken the end of his tusk off. 
looks quite square there but you see the one on the right backing up a little bit and you see and the one on the left got his ears shown out trying to make himself look bigger so look at that he's now following up behind him probably just re-establishing just letting him know yep keep walking buddy keep going but uh, we're going to sit here a little bit longer. It's totally intriguing, and I'm sure that these elephants are going to continue with their little joust. But in the meantime, let's head over to Taylor, and she can give you a bit of an update. Judy, are you wondering why elephants will eat bark? Um, is it to help with digestion? I don't think it's to help with digestion. I think, uh, more importantly, what they're trying to do is intercept nutrients that are being transported from the roots of the plants in the bark up to the leaves. So the bark is the transport system for trees. That's where all the not only liquid from the roots, but also nutrients from the soil are transported up to the leaves. So at certain times of the year, and you'll notice elephants stripping the bark off trees, predominantly the knobthorn trees in this area. I can't remember what time of year it is, but it's definitely a time of year that they'll be doing that. And that's obviously when they know the nutrients are on their way up. At other times of the year, especially during winter, there's not going to be too much transportation of minerals and nutrients from the roots up to the leaves because the tree, most of the trees are actually kind of lying dormant waiting for the summer months. So it's merely to just get, oh, yoga. I'm not sure what move that's called. But that is definitely elephant yoga. Shame, she's trying to scratch, <laughs> scratch herself, um, it appears. But she obviously just can't reach that little fold. You need to find a branch to rub on. Get a branch between those back legs and then reverse forwards and backwards over it. It appears that's going to be your best bet. <laughs> Let's see if she doesn't go and look for a branch now to do just that. <laughs> Hello Will, you'd like to know how long will elephants live for? And around 60 years is the average age that I'm told. I would love to be able to know more individual stories on elephants, some that have lived for maybe 80 years, who knows, there's always kind of random outliers and what causes elephants to die younger if they do in fact die at a younger age than 60. But 60 is the general kind of rule or general age that is given in the old textbooks. The thing is with an elephant, Will, and more so than other wild animals is that they're very difficult to follow. They don't have territories. There's a lot of them. Um, so to follow the individual life of a leopard is going to be quite tricky. It's possible, but tricky in the wild. Of an elephant, whoops, I've got leopard on the mind. I just heard a tree squirrel alarm calling. Possibly that's why I'm hoping it is a leopard not too far away. Um, so yeah, well, it would be wonderful to know kind of more individual stories on elephants, but Sadly, due to the fact that they move huge distances, they're not bound to a territory, and they do just live for so long, it would be quite an understudy to follow the life of an elephant. All right, yeah, they're going to have to reposition. We're not in the best spot anymore, although there are some on our right-hand side here yeah, on the opposite side. Although, it's, no, actually, sends a sniper to have hand reared the elephant may be able to remember whoever reared it but then again i'm not sure if that's going to be just from sight or also from smell and also from the audio the the, the voice of its rear but i think in the wild they'll have little or no reason to or need to or ability to be able to distinguish one human from another And the thing is, you know, even if there are reports of captive scenarios like that, I don't like to mix captive research with wild animal research. Although sometimes, I mean, this can be something to, to learn from there, but it's just such a different environment that the animal's living in that it doesn't really, in my opinion, make sense to take too much from research done with captive animals. Okay, interesting. Well, thanks very much, Samuel, who's provided us with some more information on the longevity of ele elephants. And it seems like the African elephants, both the forest elephants and the elephants that we are viewing here, the kind of regular plains elephants or savanna elephants, will live from anywhere between 60 and 70 years, whereas the Asian elephants only live for around 50. So that's quite interesting that there's quite a big difference between the ages of both African and Indian elephants.
Yeah, I wonder what these elephants think about the lack of rain and how much they, you know, take into consideration with regards to the abnormally dry and bleak conditions we're experiencing here this summer. And if they're kind of already planning where to head next or how do they get messages or how do they know where to go from here? Do they just guess where there might be more food as in when everything gets exhausted here? Or if they just take it kind of more on a day-to-day -day basis? But as a human, I can assure you that things are not looking as they should for this time of the year. Noel also noticed having spent a week or so away from the reserve on her leave, as soon as she came back, she immediately noticed how much drier it had become in her absence. Uh, cleaning off the grass, making sure there's no sand before she put it in her mouth. Mobile Paddy, you'd like to know if there's two different elephant herds in the same area, will they kind of huddle up? Um, elephants generally kind of huddle up when they're seeking shade. So they'll huddle under a tree while they're snoozing, kind of midday. So that is a time that elephants will huddle. And yes, I guess multiple herds may huddle under a, a shady tree. They, it's not uncommon for herds to come and go and kind of intermingle and join up, split up. Um, there's no set rules. And often it's very difficult for us to tell whether it is two separate herds or if it is just one herd that's kind of splitting and rejoining. I certainly don't recognize this herd of elephants. And again, they do move huge distances. They're not bound by territory, so it makes it very difficult for us to establish exactly what is going on within the herds. Very good. I'm probably going to leave these guys be and keep trying to search some of the roads for any sign of our spotted friends. And while we do that, we shall send you back to Noelle for an update on how she's getting along. I do. I have a hornbill on the ground, and it is a ground hornbill. So they were up on a termite mound hunting, um, hunting, <laughs> eating termites, and then came off. And to me, I can only see three. You've got the one here. This is one of the adults. And then there was a juvenile, a little teenage one, that went back into the bushes with the other male. Um, they're sort of meandering slowly in and out of the trees there and picking up things to eat. They'll eat giant land snails and snakes and insects. Um, they've got quite a varied diet. Just just out of view now, unfortunately, but a very neat one of the endangered bird species that we see in this area. I just want to see if maybe pick up another view. Kind of just see that one. Fergie must tell me if I must stop through the back there. Yeah, we can try there and see if we can get a, another viewing of them. The one sort of moved to the back here just at our 3 o'clock, and then it's slowly moving up, and there's going to be a gap at our 2 o'clock eventually. No, more to the to the right there. That should um, should pick up eventually, but we'll, we'll just sort of scan and, and see if uh, if we can find them again for you all. We got had them yesterday morning making their hoot doo 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 sounds and sitting on top of the trees there. Uh, but that grouping looked a little bit larger. Yeah, I can just see that, that one through the back end there. Um, not on the screen, unfortunately. There, just through the, those dead branches at the back. There's the juvenile. Moving off, notice how he doesn't have any red. It's a little bit more of a bluish tinged beak and then a little bit of a yellow around the face. A little bit difficult to, to keep them in focus. There's so much brush in the way, unfortunately. There we go, and then off into the great blue yonder, but that's still a wonderful setting. We've had Hello. Not just here in Africa, but in all of your home countries that no longer do. And I think massive, massive herds of elephants were reality back in the day, as well as lots of migrating animals in various parts of the world. Thankfully, there are a few little areas that have been protected, and you still get that happening. But for the larger ones, I think it's fair to say that there's just simply a lot less wild animals than nowadays than there used to be for obvious reasons. Very good. Well, Noel has made it to her next waterhole for the morning. Let's hope it's as productive as the one at Chitwa was. You can just see the, the nest on the other side forward here. Now he's up. Now he's directly at our 12 o'clock, straight up the main trunk. There he flies over there. Now he's on that. Ah, perfect. There's a male. Thanks, Ferg. Male violet back starling. Now, where he's sitting in the tree, oh, gorgeous. There you can see a bit of the reds and purples. Now, because there's no sunlight, we're not getting the absolute splendor of the iridescence of that, that uh, violet back there, that plum colored starling. But you're still getting some a nice, oh, and then of course he flies away to the back. Very brief, but there we are, violet back starlings. I can't always.
floating vegetation um, on, on top of the water here. He caught the last one, but now he's been busy stalking this one. And you can just see the little insect just in front of him on the right hand side on top of that little floating vegetation. And he is just waiting patiently to get close enough to be able to spear it. He managed to get the last one, so he's had a tiny little bit of a meal. We also had a Woodlands Kingfisher come and land just above our heads with a dung beetle that it had caught. And then its mate called and it flew off. But look at him, look at him go very slowly. I'm hoping you all can see that little black speck that's on top of that, that floating vegetation there because that's what he's after. That's the insect. And he should be close enough by now. He's keeping an eye on it with his left eye. And Kyle, you're curious to know what a greenback heron success rate would be. Kyle, I have no idea, hey? No idea the percentages of that. Um, so variable, especially if you're hunting things like insects. I would assume that it's it's quite high. It is a bird. Most bird success rates, um, especially when their insect eaters are higher, and that also just has to do with the fact that their prey species is abundant. Um, and also it's going to do a uh, supplement with things like fish and frogs like we talked about. So yeah, I would assume it's quite high, but I couldn't give you an actual number there. It's an interesting, interesting thought. I think he, I think he tried for some poking out. There's one male hippo that's always in here, and then when I was up here before I went on leave, there were three hippos that were inside of the dam. So he seems to have found some lady friends, but I don't know if they're still around. They might have decided to to move off. Now the water level of Bivelsoap Dam seems about the same as when I went on leave, but those mud pans drying up, as um, we talked about yesterday, and Scott was mentioning earlier, we do need some more rain. And our rain last night wasn't very much. I don't think we got over 10 mils. I think it was probably between five and ten, but nothing more than that. We need a good downpouring of 110 mils, if not more. Ferg, there's a cuckoo at our 10 o'clock across the edge of the dam wall. If you go in between these two, go to the left a bit more. Left. In between those two bushes there. Keep going left. Keep going, keep going. There, straight in there. There we go. Beautiful cuckoo. So as we know, cuckoos are usually hiding. This cuckoo is out and about for us. So I'm seeing a lot of black. There's a little white tip to the tail and it's just turning a bit and there's a, a bit of a white breast there. So this is either going to be a Jacobin's cuckoo or possibly a Lavellans cuckoo. A Lavellans cuckoo used to be called a striped cuckoo because it had striping on the breast. Now I actually need him to turn around a little bit for me or he could call and then let us know. But while we're busy having a look, you can just see that little bit of a crest and then... The only thing though is that a jackal doesn't really have as strong of a bite force or as sharp a teeth as lions do. So it might struggle to pull some chunks of flesh uh, from, from the side closest to us because it doesn't look like there's any part of the buffalo closest to us that's been opened. And that means that that jackal's going to have to go around to the other end. You can see there's some cars <laughs> getting closer. Quite lean as well. Actually looks like it could be a female just because she looks quite slight. Yeah, there's a girl. Hello, beautiful. Definitely looks like she needs a meal, though. Looking a bit on the summer side. She's got her summer body ready. Jenny, you're wondering if I think that this jackal's going to steal the kill? Not the entire thing. I, that day that I see a jackal dragging a buffalo carcass, my goodness, I'm, I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm not working in the bush anymore. That would be petrifying. Don't you think, Manu? Imagine a jackal dragging... Soup. There we go. The lion's seen the jackal now, though. Uh, so, no, I don't think it's going to take the entire carcass, but it's definitely going to try and sneak a few mouthfuls, that's for sure. But that male lion has now seen the jackal. Sometimes the lions don't even mind them being around, but you can see that tail's now wagging. And the fact that he keeps lifting up his head, he's probably not too impressed by the fact that this jackal thinks that it can just walk on over to this buffalo, which he's worked very hard to take down and just reap his rewards. It's a very efficient way, of course, of feeding, scavenging. And jackals know that, especially when you need a quick meal. <laughs> Matt, you said that those jackals are sneaky. They are indeed. They most certainly are sneaky, sly creatures. I really am enjoying them, and I've been saying this quite often now. Uh, I've definitely learned a lot more about jackals out here on the Mara than I've ever been able to before, just because they're, they're so 
well, they're just everywhere out here. They're so common, which is really nice. And the fact that we can watch the youngsters growing up and some of them become quite habituated to the cars already is really amazing and really valuable. And I'm enjoying the intimate time I've had a chance to, well, to spend with these animals. There we go. He's sitting up now. Maybe he's a bit older, this lion. His teeth are quite good. Maybe he's closer to five and a half. He kind of looks like how the Birminghams looked when they first arrived or when the Charleston males first arrived down in the southwestern corner of the Saibi Sand in South Africa. So I'm going to say he's between five and five and a half years old. Maybe pushing six, just because his mane is starting to, to darken a little bit. But again, that also doesn't mean anything. He might just have a genetic... That means he has a dark mane. Bless you. <laughs> that wasn't anybody sneezing on our car. That was on another car, and I can't not say bless you. Manu, does that make you laugh? The things we hear out on safari is amazing. But he's a beautiful cat though. So is his jackal. Now Alex, you're wondering... A thick, thick, thick long tail. Um, but they actually have quite small bodies, these little cuckoos. And um, they don't... They fly down here for the summertime, but they don't make their own nests. They're what's known as a brood parasite. So they put their eggs into other birds' nests and let those birds... Um, take care of them. So I am guessing from what we can see with the white at the tip of the tail that this is most likely going to be a Jacobin's cuckoo. The Lavellans tends to have a black tip as opposed to a white and the Jacob they're roughly the same size and we've seen just enough of the side of under his chin for there for me to say that there's no striping. So we're going to go with a Jacobin's cuckoo here. One of the more common cuckoos that we see now, one of the cuckoos that I haven't seen yet this year is a thick-billed cuckoo um, or a greater spotted cuckoo. I haven't heard or seen them yet this year, so it would be nice to see them. But we will just have to keep waiting, I think. It's still early days. I can hear... Oh, beautiful. Thanks, Ferg. There's that violet back starling again. The male. And the colorations there are looking a little bit better. <laughs> Lady Starfire, you're saying how stunning this male violet back starling is, and you think you have a new favorite bird. They're also one of my favorites. I would agree with you there wholeheartedly. Okay, everybody, I think we're going to get a last little view and sat still for half a moment. I think if we try and move straight in there ferg yeah no just go straight in from where you are yeah they're just oh there he flies there he comes here he comes here he comes oh my goodness and then away away all right there was also a sterling's wren wobbler oh there they're at their back now so at um half 11 where that line around in there so yeah if we go straight and then to the right a little bit to the right there here they're flying around in the back there go down a bit here in that one they were moving around just in there. There's, there we are. Fantastic, thank you. Sorry, they're so little and it's such a dark shade out here that it's sometimes very difficult when they start flying around um, to, to catch them. Now they usually do something called hawking. <clears throat> so they, from their perch, they go and, and fly up and grab an insect and then go back to their perch. And that's exactly what they were. You guys came to us with Scott and then there was four of them and they got into a little spat. <clears throat> Now the sterlings, I can still see them moving around there, pretty much in the same spot, doing their hawking. Excuse me one second, I've just got a cough. <coughs> Excuse me. Now that sterlings wren wobbler is a really amazing bird, um, and I'm very upset that he stopped calling for you, but it would definitely be something to put onto our bird list. I just want to show you a photo of him quickly. Mr. Coldwater, yes, uh, we're right here at 3 o'clock, Ferg. He's just orange and blue with a blue head flying. Oh, perfect. Yes, Mr. Coldwater, a snake eagle is um, a little bit smaller than a fish eagle, roundabouts. I can triple check in the book. I just, I mean, this paradise flycatcher is being so nice to us right now. I hope you all saw that flying around with those sort of rusty burnt orange colors and that sort of bluish head. There we are. It looks like a female. The males tend to have much longer tails to them. They make these beautiful tiny little cup nests in the little crooks of trees. Absolutely stunning. I love paradise flycatchers. And looking for insects. And now the tree that she's hopping around on has a lot of ant activity on it. Um, and so I'm, I have a feeling that's what she's picking up. Now I'm just checking on the sizes of those birds that we were just talking about now. So a fish eagle is 63 to 73 centimeters. And the 
snake eagles if I can find them. Of course, I can't find them. Snake eagles, brown snake eagle is seven, 70 to 75. So the brown snake eagle is actually a larger than the African fish eagle by about 8 to 10 centimeters. So there we are. Now, they, these little um, fly catchers will also use uh, two males. It sounds like two males having a bit of a, a vocal uh, dispute at the moment. Have a little listen. Can you hear them? They're not flying around now, chasing one another like they were just a moment ago. They were too quick for us. It seems to have all settled down, but just as we were starting the show, I just kept seeing these flashes of yellow uh, bombing down from trees into the long grass and then up from the long grass and onto small shrubs. And now this one male is sat up on a little shrub and he is calling his heart out. So I think he must have won that little dispute. And we're seeing a, a lot of action with the birds lately from building nests to, well, of course, uh, beautiful displays, mating displays, and then, of course, these territorial displays too. Yes, thank you, Taylor. And uh, just speaking of sing-offs, I do challenge the Kenyans versus the South Africans to a sing-off of national anthems by Christmas time. Now, welcome aboard the afternoon game drive. We are here live with Safari Live in Kenya, all the way in the Masai Mara. And it, I don't know how many elephants are here, but it is one of those days where they're just all out in the marsh. And I can tell you that if I had to say how happy am I, I would be as happy as an elephant in the marsh because they've got water, they've got food, and they all just seem so happy. Now, please join us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and the YouTube live chat. Send us your questions and your comments because we'd love to have you involved. This is the largest game drive in the world, and we will be happy to show you lots of action. But for now, it is a very very relaxed, very serene. There's the odd elephant having a bit of argy-bargy, and uh, I'm not sure where he went, but there was a warthog masquerading as one as well. I think he felt he was quite safe here in amongst the big guys. He wouldn't get chased by those pesky lions. But everybody happy just to be mooching around? Now, Vanessa, you're commenting that you'd love to be here. Well, I would love to have you with us, but uh, for now, we'll have to do it via the internet, and we'll keep bringing you these live images from the Maasai Triangle. And I look at that little youngster. He's really, that's probably within a year's age. You can see now what I was talking about this morning, those ears really overlapping at the top, almost there. They're just starting to come apart. So we're talking around a year's old, but this is still a, a very small little youngster, and see how he's battling to use that trunk of his, not quite knowing whether to push or pull, whether to blow or suck. It's really fun to watch, and sticking very close to mum. Mia, you're wondering how old that little youngster is? Well. He's within a year of age because, as I was saying, you, you can judge by the, once they get use of their trunk or once they start to know how to use it, and once the ears... Oh, what a lovely elephant story, Ralph. I know that I enjoy elephant stories, and I'd actually like to sit and listen to some of them. Maybe I'll have to go back and watch the show. Now, we have not got something as beautiful as an elephant, I'm afraid. We've got a filthy hyena who's just laying next to the road and doesn't really seem to care that we are even here today. Which is quite cool. And it's actually quite a common sight in the in the Maras to see how units scattered along the roads, just resting in all the puddles where the water's built up. Oh, flies bothering you. Yes, that seems to be a problem for all of the animals at the moment, after all the rain. Although we haven't had too much rain now the last few evenings. There have been a couple of downpours, but nothing nothing <clears throat> uh, causing any more flash floods. Doing a big rollover. Does that feel nice? They're so funny to watch these hyenas. This doesn't quite look like an adult just yet, it's actually still quite small, so I reckon it's on its way to adulthood, not too far off. And definitely been sitting in the mud today, twitching its ears. They've actually got very hairy ears. And look at all the different colours that they have. Okay, yes, this one is particularly dirty, so it's quite <laughs> brown and muddy at the moment, but I love how it's managed to keep its ears clean. <laughs> very nice hyena. Isn't it so precious? I think they're quite precious animals. No, Sherry, you're not the only one. I promise you right now that I also think that this hyena is very cute. I think that they're adorable animals. They're really funny to watch. 
I mean, this one's not particularly entertaining at the moment, but to watch them at a den, they are hilarious. Just watching the different interactions between um, between the members of the clan is, is really interesting. And watching the sort of hierarchy fights that also happen, which are quite common with the youngsters as they're starting to develop their position within the clan, is also quite interesting to watch. And you know what we need to do is when we go across the river, we're going to have to pop past Mosiara and stop at that big hyena den that is not too way far away. But let's carry on because I do want to see what's happening with this line. I find it particularly terrible. I also don't like the smell of wildebeest and waterbuck. They stink. Wildebeest makes my stomach turn straight away. Their coat smells like burnt butter that's been left out in the sun for a long time. It's not nice. And water bugs smell like dirty drain water. Wild dogs smell something like old sweaty socks that have had blue cheese uh, ripening in them. So, <laughs> so those are my three worst smells. And then any carcass that's been sitting in the sun for longer than three days uh, makes me gag. I have such a weak stomach, it's so embarrassing. Even if I see somebody else wanting to get sick, then I start uh, gagging too. It's not particularly pleasant. So uh, sightings with rotting carcasses are not my favorite. I can stomach the smells of wild dogs, wildebeest, and and waterback and all the other stinky creatures out here. But um, yeah, rotting carcass is my absolute worst. Rotting hyena carcass was... Uh, was not very nice. But yeah, so these Impala Ram are just munching about. There's even a young giraffe that's coming to join the sighting. I think it's feeling a little bit left out this afternoon. Just walking past a small group of buffalo that are resting in the grass. It's so hot. It was actually really nice when the clouds came over and there's just big pockets of them. And when it casts that shadow, it's, it's such a beautiful temperature. But as soon as the sun pokes its head through the clouds, my goodness, it's quite humid. So I think there is going to be some rain building this afternoon. And hopefully we can play the game of avoid the rain. Or we'll try our absolute best to, of course, do that. Young, this is a young male giraffe. There are quite a few other giraffe all in the distance just feeding uh, sort of towards the middle of this grassland where there's some small shrubs. Not quite too much that they can feed off along the river road. A couple of smaller shrubs, but I don't know how tasty they are. And some water back too. Yes, thanks Taylor. Um, I, I've got so many elephant stories, but I don't want to tell them to you all at once, because what would I be able to tell you on my next drive? But look at this little youngster. He's put a whole bunch of grass on his head. Now, that is also in practice for when they are older, and generally the older bulls especially, once they try to show their stuff towards uh, whether it be a vehicle or another male or anything aggressively towards them, they also start to put things on their head. And that, I think, in some way, trying to show that they're a little bit bigger than the rest. Now, I know Taylor was answering the question that uh, which animal is the smelliest for her? Well, for me, in my experience, it has to be said that a brown hyena is a really smelly bug of perfume that it might actually contain uh, some form of anal pasting of a civet. Yeah, quite uh, uh, a weird thought that, but let's get back to the, the happy-go-lucky elephants moving through the plain and grazing as they go. We've been listening to them communicate with that low rumble. It's uh, a very humbling experience to be in the presence of so many elephants out here. And uh, there's all walks of life here, big and small. And as I said, there was a warthog moving through them as well just now. And he was almost the size of that little one over there. Now, Carl, you're wondering how many elephants we can see. Well, if Archie comes back a little bit here. Yes, thanks, Taylor. Uh, there's a little bit of a Mexican standoff still continuing here, and you can almost hear the good, the bad, and the ugly in the background. <whistles> Look at that. Who's going to back down? Oh, the youngsters. Now, there seems to be a little bit of action, but I think these, these two youngsters, they're going to possibly just fizzle out, so... And we'll just wait and see if they start to continue a little bit. I hope there's be a little bit more action, but we don't want to press them into a complete fight. But they are of the age where they can start to fight for real. And especially where you've got big groups of elephants like this, it is a, it is a little bit of a power struggle. And that's where I go back to that African proverb that really makes a lot of sense where when two bull elephants fight it's the grass that suffers the most and that goes right through to power struggles with humans when you've got kings or presidents or incumbent presidents and everybody fighting over power for countries it's normally the, the poverty-stricken people on the ground that suffer the most and 
uh, we watch these guys. We'd hope that they can settle their differences without continuing too much, but uh, a lot of headbutting can go on and, and, and generally face-to-face -face kind of standoffs. I've seen a lovely standoff in Itosha National Park where there was a whole herd of elephants next to the waterhole and it was mostly females with youngsters and there was one young bull probably around one of these individuals age and he was pushing his weight around trying to mate with the females and uh, pushing everybody around and you could see there was quite a lot of consternation with the with the adult female oh my word did i just watch <laughs>